Okay. So welcome everyone, full house. Uh, so we have uh, Katharina Krompholz here today. She's an alumna from Tijuana. She did her PhD here. Um, and now she's a tenured faculty at CISPA in Saarbrücken, where she leads her own research group. She's also pretty well known that both in the security community and in the human computer in action community because she's working on how to make systems both more secure and privacy friendly, but in a way that users actually can use this kind of things. And yeah. At least we're trying. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me. Actually, for me, it's really a big pleasure because I have spent my undergrad and my grad studies here, and I love Vienna and I love TU Vienna. So it's it's really a pleasure to now spread my mission and spread uh, the word about my research. And I'm really looking forward to some uh, discussions um, that we will be having afterwards. And I hope that the talk will be a little bit of an inspiration for that. So I'm talking about. Um, the human factors perspective towards making uh, privacy and security guarantees a little bit more understandable. But before we start talking about this particular topic, I would like to give you a little bit more information about myself because I think it's always nice to you know know the research um, mission, the research personality behind the person who is speaking. So my mission is to make privacy and security technology more effective by considering the human factor on all different levels and all different stages. So I'm not only considering the end user who is probably a non-tech savvy person, but I'm really trying to consider all humans along the line between the idea of a protocol to the development of a new system or a new tool until the end user who then in the end gets exposed to all these systems. Um, besides that, I mean, we're publishing a lot of papers uh, on that topic, but uh, besides that, it's my mission to set methodological and ethical standards for research, which is why I'm also a founding member of the Ethics Committee at CISPA, part of the Ethics Committee of uh, the university close by. And um, yeah, it's really important for me to set methodological standards because I think uh, computer science is so awesome because we do have such a rich set of scientific methods to choose from. And uh, yeah, I think higher standards really ensure better reproducibility um, and um, more steps forward. And interdisciplinarity is like one of my key missions. So one of my missions is to build bridges. And I think also within computer science, there are a lot of bridges that can be built between all the subdisciplines, but also to uh, adjacent fields, like for example, social sciences, design um, and whatever. And yeah, besides that, it's important to me to make our field a little bit more inclusive, um, build bridges to other countries, um, be a little more, bit more inclusive in terms of gender and support talents from all over the world. Um, I currently have seven PhD students, a postdoc and a couple of interns, uh, mostly from India and Pakistan. And um, yeah, I really try to not only educate them, but also to have fun activities and, for example, go to baseball matches or uh, attend an Indian wedding of one of my PhD students in New Delhi last year. So to better position my research, so as Martina said, I am actually working at the intersection of security and privacy and human computer interaction. And what's important to say that all the problems that I'm working on are inherently interdisciplinary. So they cannot be solved by just looking at the security and privacy or HCI perspective alone. And um, because of that, of course, our publishing uh, publishing um, mission is also to publish in the top tier security and privacy outlets, as well as in the top tier HCI venues. And then there is a dedicated venue for security and privacy, usable security and privacy research, which is called SOUPS, uh, of which I'm also the co-chair um, for this in next year. So, which is also a really great way of ensuring the high methodological standards of our small but growing community. My research um, is now getting so big that I had to actually split it in four areas. So the four areas are understandable security and privacy, usable security for developers, administrators, and decision makers, authentication beyond passwords, and then new methodology or the validation of existing methodology. And today, we will we talk a little bit about making security and privacy guarantees more tangible and understandable, uh, we will actually only touch a very, very small subset of work that we're doing in the very first area, which is understandable security and privacy. And I hope to be able to come to Teovin uh, again and maybe talk about all the other uh, areas that we work in. So let's start with some good news. I'm an optimistic and positive person. So I would like to um, start with the good news, which is that 
at this time, security and privacy treatments are widely available, which is a great thing, because if you compare the internet ecosystem to the internet ecosystem of 10, 20 years ago, users had a much smaller subset of methods to choose from. And now we really have a lot of methods for all different kinds of security problems. And many of these methods are very well validated. And um, yeah, there is a common sense that they are good and they actually really uh, manage to solve some of the security challenges. But comparing to medicine, uh, I came up with three questions that I would like to answer um, using some of the research papers that we recently published. The first one is, are the leaflets that we give together with all these treatments to users actually giving proper directions, similar to pills that we distribute um, in case somebody has a disease or wants to prevent the disease? Second question, are our medicines actually making the patients healthy? So do they really help the user to solve their security and privacy problem? And then the third question, which I think is a pretty tricky one, and we will talk a lot about that, which is, are these drug interactions safe? So what about combining different security and privacy measures? Does this work or does this create additional burden? In case it's late for you, I'll give you the short answers and then we'll dig into the details. First, are leaflets giving proper directions? No. So according to one of our recent studies that we published at CHI, um, where we did a study where we had a look at semi-autonomous vehicles and tried to understand what piece of information a user needs to make the right decision in case of a malfunction or an attack. Um, does this really help users to make the decision properly? And we found out the directions that systems give users are actually not really suitable. So if you wanna have a look at the paper, this is the QR code, but I will talk about it with a, in a little bit more detail later on. Second question, also a no. Are our medicines making our patients healthy? No, not really. So according to one of our papers from USENIC Security last year, strong security measures like, for example, authenticity check, checks for hardware security tokens are not really suitable to mitigate real world threats that actually matter to users. So our medicines are not really making our patients healthy, although we have quite strong medicines available. And the third question, which is a very recent paper, um, is our drug interaction safe? Well, also no, because according to this very recent papers, users think that combining security and privacy measures will give them more security or better privacy, while in fact, combining these measures, as in the case of Tor and VPNs, is actually very harmful practice. So, Long story short, I will now tell you a little bit more why this is the case. And I would like to start with one of the questions I always get, especially when I talk to computer scientists who have, for example, had very little interactions with human factors research, which is why does the human factor even matter? Well, TU Vienna has a mission statement, which is technique for mention. And I think that's actually a very strong statement because the technology that we develop should not stand in the way of users. However, unusable security privacy is standing in the way of users. So you just try to read that, but what's happening, some disruptive security and privacy warning pops up and prevents you from actually following your primary interaction goal, which in this case is just reading the text on my slide. But you know, whenever you try to browse the web and visit a website or want to buy anything online, these things will pop up and actually stand in your way. And users are really good. Humans are very good at circumventing barriers. So, you know, putting these barriers in our ways is not really helpful because yeah, humans will just find the way around these barriers or find just any other way to achieve their primary interaction goal. Why is this the case? I mean, we know the problem very well. The problem is security and privacy technology is designed following a systems design approach. So what we're doing is we're starting mostly from the cryptographic fundamentals and then we're over engineering security. We want to put all the security stuff that we have into the product. And then in the end, we throw it on users. We probably discover that it's unusable. We add some usability, make it a little bit more beautiful. And then we wonder why it doesn't really serve its purpose. And that is because usability and human factors are often just an afterthought and considered a purely aesthetic add-on, which they're not. 
Furthermore, we are now living in a very exciting area of the digitization of everyday things, which makes all these information sharing models behind these pieces of technology more and more complex. And not even developers really truly understand how all these systems are connected. Computers are everywhere and many of them are often invisible. Sometimes this is done on purpose. And one example for such an intentional lack of visibility of where the data is going is this smart speaker blends in very well with your furniture. It shows only a small percentage of the tasks that this, or of the functionality this piece of technology is actually able to fulfill, which is it's a speaker. It looks like a speaker. Anybody would put it in their bedroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, because it is convenient. You can just give it voice commands and you will get something out of it. And this is intentional. This is an intentional design choice that the vendors of this product made because what they actually want to hide from you is that this device is constantly listening to you and transferring anything you say to the, in this particular case, Amazon servers. To then of course, help you with something that you ask this assistant for, but actually in fact, you know, there's so much more information that leaves these devices and as the end user, you have no idea of understanding where this information ends. If this system would be differently designed, for example, if it had ears, people would just not put it in their bedrooms. And people would be a little bit extra careful in what they say in front of this device. You see, both of these devices have the same functionality. Just in this case where it has ears, it communicates what it does more directly to the user. And if it would look like that, people would use it differently. And people would find this device severely invasive to their privacy. Just because it doesn't look like that, because it is unobtrusive and very neutral and blends in very well with the rest of your apartment, you would be willing to use such a spy device that records anything you say. So well, now I have talked a lot about how bad everything is. Um, and oops, we do have so many new ideas to get rid of the human factors. One idea is autonomous systems. Are autonomous systems really the answer to challenges with human factors or AI? This is actually one of the most frequent questions I get when I talk about that the human factor is a problem that people say, but cannot AI just solve the problem? Well, the bad news is that neither autonomous systems nor AI will be able to get rid of the human factor. In fact, these paradigms just shift the human factor component to a different stage of the design process or of just of the whole usage or the context in which it is used. Because, even autonomous systems rely on user input at various stages. The problem is they often require input when the situation is highly complex and when not even the developer or the designer of that system knows what to do. The problem is in order to really then take the right decisions, users also need useful information to make the right decision and not just, okay, I am the computer, I don't know what to do, you take over, like it is um, the case in semi-autonomous driving at the moment. Also, security and privacy aspects are even difficult for developers and designers. And our research with developers has shown that they are not security experts. They actually don't really understand that much about security. Also, it's not really of their business because what they're trying to do is to implement what somebody else tells them to do. Unfortunately, because of that, all vulnerabilities that we find in the systems out there are caused by humans. So not only end users are the problem. So now I would like to, again, come back to this um, example for um, information demand. So we conducted a study that was actually an uh, A-B testing study where we had two different scenarios that are realistic in the scenario of autonomous or semi-autonomous driving. Um, the first one was a video where Tesla actually um, drove into these small, um, how are they called? I'm always missing the world in these small, um, yes, thank you, that are like in the middle of the road because there is a construction going on. 
And in the video, you just see that Tesla is just ignoring them and driving through them. And then um, in this particular case, the driver needs to take over. And we exposed, and we know that the scenario can occur because of a sensor malfunction, which is basically a safety issue, or just because the car is under attack. Both could be. And we chose this and another scenario where both a safety and security incident could be the root cause of the problem, exposed users or drivers of these semi-autonomous cars to the situation, and then wanted to see which piece of information they need in order to you know, steer the car safely out of the situations. And we saw that it actually does make a huge impact how we communicate these problems to users. So they really need good information, well-prepared information because they have a very limited amount of time to make the right decision. This paper was published at CHI in 2022 and shows that autonomous systems are not ultimately the answer um, as long as they require user input, especially when it's too complex for the system to handle. Let's move a little bit more towards understandable guarantees um, and the blurry boundary between understandable security guarantees and security theater. So especially the field of formal methods and cryptography have a lot of advances into guarantees. And I think that's something that ultimately we need. We need somehow to end this arms race um, between attackers and defenders. And we also really need to somehow be able to verify that some security and privacy properties hold and we can guarantee them. In this talk, I will not talk about that aspects because that's not, not an area that I'm really competent in. But what I am interested in is how can we communicate these guarantees or these security properties to the end user so that the user really understands what's going on? And how can we prevent our systems from just faking some security that is not there or from pretending that a situation or a system is secure while it's not? Security theater actually sometimes really make me angry because it works so well, because that's the human nature. So I think all of you have seen security theater at the airport when you travel. So there's a lot of security checks going on. And in fact, these checks they can maybe prevent some security incidents, but for sure not all. And what they're really good at is they are giving you the feeling that somebody takes care of your safety because you're checked for explosives, for any liquids. So we have the feeling that we really take care of security. Unfortunately, this is something that technology also does to users. Also there, we often expose users to decision-making and give them a feeling of they are in charge and they can make an impact. And when they use this or that technology, they will have a more secure experience online. One example where this is particularly badly done is the case of cookie banners. So I think all of you know these banners where somebody usually says, we value your privacy or we care about your privacy. That is something that I really don't like to read there because if they would care for my privacy, they would not even think of you know, having a tracker on the website and share my data with all these different advertising companies. So what happens there is that mostly these um, cookie notices or cookie banners, they use a so-called deceptive design. So they trick you into making a decision that is not in your favor, but in the company's favor, which is usually to you know, share all the data with everyone. So what we're doing here is we're giving humans the feeling that they have a choice. We give them the feeling that we take care about their security and privacy. Well, in fact, this is just security theater or privacy theater, or as we called it in this alt Kai paper from 2022, constant theater. And I think this is very concerning because when people think they are secure, privacy preserving, they would act differently than if they know that they were potentially under some risk. That's just the human nature. When you know that all your secrets are safe, you will probably share information that you wouldn't share otherwise. So giving people a false sense of security is very, very harmful. Yeah, as I said, understandable guarantees, security and privacy is fragile due to the ongoing arms race between attackers and defenders. But how can we make sure that these guarantees hold in the real world? I have said earlier that security and privacy technology often follows the systems design approach. 
So very often, um, the security technology makes implicit assumptions on threat models or um, security is simply over-engineered because we don't know which threat models are relevant in the wild, but we know that cryptography uh, is a good way um, of you know, improving security, but it's not really clear if, if the benefits that we can give on paper hold in the real world environment. So the problem that we discovered is that neither users nor vendors understand which threats matter and which guarantees actually hold in the wild. One paper that we recently published on that, which actually is a collaboration also with Martina Lindorfer, is um, an analysis of anti-stalkerware apps and what users think anti-stalkerware apps do, which we compare to the technical reality. I mean, I think this is borderline also security theater, right? Because what we found when we reverse engineered um, these apps was that actually um, the technical reality looks much different to what users think that these apps do, which actually means that victims of stalkerware actually behave differently and therefore maybe have like life-threatening risks associated with that. A big problem is also that many of the problems and many of the threats that we see in the wild are not purely technical problems. And it's sometimes unclear if we can solve these problems with technology. It's complicated. We really need to better understand threat models that matter to users in the wild. Another example that we discovered is um, authenticity checks for hardware security tokens. So what we're seeing these days, and I think partially it's pretty good, is that a lot of trust is moved away from software to hardware. So we say hardware can be trusted. Use hardware wallets to manage cryptocurrencies. Use FIDO tokens for passwordless authentication or use two-factor authentication to you know, have stronger authentication overall. But does this shift to this shift shift the trust to hardware actually makes sense? And what are actually the threat models that this provides, this provides um, mitigation against? So what we did in this paper, which was published at USENIC Security a while ago, is um, we had a look at hardware wallets, um, 2FA or passwordless authentication tokens, and wanted to understand how trustworthy they are and to understand what about supply chain attacks? Is this a threat? Is this a problem? And can we actually verify the authenticity of these uh, devices, of these hardware security tokens? And are there really ways that are usable to do that? So what we did to understand the effectiveness of these authenticity checks for hardware security tokens is we performed a market review with cognitive walkthroughs. And then also we performed a formative focus group study and an empirical study with almost 200 participants to understand whether there's a gap between what the market claims to offer and what users think is being offered. So if you're interested in the type of methodology um, that we use, because I haven't talked much about that. So for example, the market review um, is actually a cognitive walkthrough, which means that we just traverse all the different stages uh, of the user interface and then um, qualitative coding is actually applied. Qualitative coding is a method from social sciences where um, we try to find structure in unstructured data and abstract from this unstructured data. And this is a actually quite systematic way, um, which is common for this qualitative data that is unstructured. And um, we actually determine three categories in which these uh, attestation methods are, which is the packaging, the hardware, and the software attestation. Well, the human subject study was a quantitative study that we um, conducted online with users of YubiKeys, hardware security wallets, and smartphones. And then we performed a series of statistical tests and um, rejected the null hypothesis when P was smaller than 0 0.05. So we had a 95% confidence interval. And also we um, did some corrections for multiple testings, which is what you usually do in statistics um, if you uh, um, do multiple uh, testing of hypotheses. So what we found actually was a lot of security theater. So very often holographic stickers are used to say, this is legit. This is something that is you know, completely trustworthy. And also there is this tamper-proof packaging, which should suggest to users that they are the first people who have it in their hand. 
both of this is security theater because you can easily just repack a device if you modify it or replace it or add some additional functionality to that. And the same thing goes for holographic stickers. Just order them online and just put them there. How can anybody judge if this is a sticker from the vendor or just from an attacker who put it on there? What we also found was actually that um, technical and usability issues of these authenticity checks often undermine the security benefits that these checks um, should offer. There is a trade-off between transparency and easy access to attackers. So for example, sometimes methods rely on visual inspection. So they have openable casts, which of course also helps an attacker to um, modify or replace or understand actually what's going on in the device. And what we also found is that even best case implementations of, for example, firmware attestation are so difficult to perform that not even we as security researchers were able to perform them. And actually also vendors often claim that they help against various different attacks where nobody knows if those are really relevant in the wild, while in fact, they're actually not really suitable to mitigate these attacks. So this is like really a mismatch in advertising, in the technical reality. And then there's also a mismatch to what the user actually thinks um, this protects them against. Yes. So now I would like to come uh, actually also to the topic of combining security methods. So remember the pill example. So we have lots of different countermeasures against lots of different attacks. What if we now start combining them? We looked into the curious case of Tor over VPN. So maybe some of you know the movie Money Heist. Um, there is one scene where actually one of the main characters says, I'm also diverting all data traffic with a VPN via the Tor browser. And when we saw that, we were like, ah, interesting, because that's actually a case of where, I'm moving too much for the camera, I'm sorry, um, where actually there is maybe not a trustworthy advice to us because it's just a movie, where people suggest the combination of different, in this particular case, privacy measures, VPNs and Tor. And then we had the idea of investigating this case a little bit further. And this is one of our really, really brand new papers, uh, which um, we will be publishing at CCW 2023. Uh, paper titles, Investigating Security Folklore, a case study on the Tor over VPN phenomenon. So coming back to the scenery, uh, who of you thinks it's a good idea to um, use VPN and Tor in combination? No. Uh, so I assume everybody says no because nobody raised their hand and said yes. So why is it not a good idea? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um. Is this a problem? If you want to know what, know what you're doing, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. Any other reasons why this is not good, or are there situations in, in which it is good? Maybe I'm the last Yeah. Yeah. Maybe easier if you can follow the first half. Yes. It's correct. Yeah. In the question of like where it might be a good idea, blocking the tour and entry points is a very popular censorship. Yes, that's true. VPNs might be more readily available. Yes, but there's another way around this. Better way? Yes, okay. Uh, how likely, for example, are timing attacks as you? When you need the first one for the first and the last one. So it depends on that, I guess. So it's unlikely if the contender has got enough uh, uh, so it's unlikely if you use it or not. Yeah. So interestingly, we seem to have a consensus, although maybe nobody wanted to raise their hand and say yes, that it's not a good idea. But what we see in the discussion is that it's actually not so easy to justify why it is not a good idea, because there are several different reasons or situations in which it can be hardful, but it's not necessarily that big of a problem. Interestingly, like when we submitted this paper, for the first time, 
we also had reviewers a little bit arguing about if it's really a bad idea or a good idea. And as a result, now we have a much uh, longer description of our threat model with uh, much more citations. And also like when we look at the related work, even in related work, it's not so crystal clear what the consensus really is, I would say. So why it should not be done? Uh, the most common things we found in the literature is like de-anonymization, men in the middle attacks. And as you said, uh, yeah, VPNs are a first hop in Tor. So it's similar to a malicious Tor guard note. So actually experts have lots of reasons not to recommend it. However, there are actually situations in which it could be useful, which is either um, circumventing censorship when uh, the Tor network is blocked and VPNs are not blocked, or to hide Tor traffic from, from ISPs. Yeah. However, if you think of it, Tor bridges would be the much better solution to that problem. So maybe combining Tor yeah, is a little bit of an overkill. So yes yes exactly exactly so it's yeah basically i would also say just don't do it people still do it we wanted to understand how many people do it and why people do it and this is why we actually came up with a quite comprehensive methodological framework framework we used the theory of recent action uh, as a baseline to define a set a series actually of studies to aggregate and triangulate data from multiple sources to really explain the phenomenon in depth. So the first thing we did was a measurement study. So we run some Tor nodes in the Tor network, and then we try to classify whether um, VPN connections are over this uh, are going over this node. We also try to quantify how much data goes over these nodes. And yeah, we use some, yeah, we actually have a classifier to, to say whether this is a VPN or not. We had some differential privacy stuff implemented. And so we had a quite comprehensive measurement setup for that. And in the end, what we found out is that about 6.23%, um, if I read this correctly, actually um, use Tor over VPN. And that's not nothing. Especially given that it's very questionable if this is a good practice. And the question is also, how do you even get this idea? I mean, I don't think everybody watches Money Heist, right? So in order to understand that, we actually implemented a survey where we asked people whether they did this already, why they did it, what benefits they expect from it. And then we also performed a qualitative analysis of different advice sources that people might come across when they, when they go online. So let me answer the question why people do that. Well, actually, what we found was that users do not have articulated threat models and do not really know which security benefits to understand from this practice which I think is weird because then why would you do it? What we found is also that some people think that Tor is a danger per se and that VPNs just protect them against the darkness. Interesting. Now, if we look back a little bit more on the theory of recent actions, which actually has a series of beliefs um, that form an intention and then result in a behavior, behavioral beliefs, normative beliefs, and control beliefs, we found that actually normative beliefs are um, the real reason why users do this. So users simply look at others, for example, information sources, advice from friends. So there's a kind of a social proof that actually tells them this is a good idea, but they don't really understand it and they don't really know what benefits from to expect. They just do it because others do it and there is this social proof from it. Interesting case, because as we now know that normative beliefs are the root cause of the problem, we can actually craft advice sources accordingly. And what we could also do is we could also inform users that this is not a good practice. This could be implemented, for example, in the Tor browser. Would be an easy thing to do, a very quick fix to avoid a large number of users, because imagine six point, almost 6.5% almost doing this, a large number of users who thinks that they are much more privacy, that they have much more privacy when they use the internet because of this combination behavior, but they put themselves under risk and have actually marginal to no benefits from this behavior. So yeah, lessons learned from this. 
neither users nor vendors nor designers are in agreement regarding threat models that matter in the wild. We see this across all the different cases. The line between security theater and understandable security benefits or privacy benefits is very, very blurry. And the benefits are often not really clear in the real world, nor do these guarantees or um, security properties actually hold in the real world, as we see, because there's so much that can go wrong and especially so many damage that can be done by, for example, just combining security measures. Also, what we found, yeah, security be behavior is influenced by normative beliefs, advice sources, and therefore design and advice sources need to be transformed accordingly to actually nudge people more towards making the right decisions. So coming back to this medicine example, so we have to talk to our patients more because we have to understand what they do, why they do it, and what benefits they need and what threat models they actually want to protect themselves against. It's also our responsibility to move away from this just purely lab, purely theoretical perspective and validation of security methods to actually clinical trials. So just, you know, putting out the stuff in the real world, seeing how users interact with it, and then actually measure the behavior of users on real world systems, just like we did in the Tor network. So we actually just measured the impact of human behavior on the entire system and network, especially with respect to our Tor nodes. And we also need to better communicate um, security properties or even guarantees and associated risks of some behavioral patterns to users and avoid placebo solutions such as security theater. So before coming to an end, um, this was just a very, very small topic that we cover, which is understandable security, understandable privacy and security, which is the area you see in the top left. So um, just to give you a quick outlook on what else we do. So for example, um, in the case of usable security for developers, admins, and decision makers, we look, for example, at web security. We also have collaborations here um, with Teovin, um, research on content security policy, trusted types. Uh, we are looking at next cloud users um, that are actually also administrators, often non-tech savvy ones. We have looked at how developers deal with adversarial machine learning. And we believe that with covering this more expert perspective on vulnerabilities, we will be able to eliminate the root cause causes better of uh, vulnerabilities in software by just looking at this perspective. In the area of authentication beyond passwords, um, yeah, we looked at uh, visual digital certificates. We look a lot on hardware security tokens and attestation of which I also talked today. This also fits in very well in this area. And now a very hot and upcoming topic is smart home and voice assistance, um, where we also have a completely different perspective or we need a completely different perspective on authentication. My big passion, I mean, I'm passionate for all of these four fields, but what I'm especially enthusiastic about is new methodology. So what we are currently doing or what we have actually done in the past is try to come up with validated measurement instruments. For example, we have proposed a psychometric scale to measure privacy values of users. Uh, we have come up with a new design methodology for user-centric security design. And what we have actually shown is by just following this user-centric design approach, we were actually able to, in the field of uh, secure messaging, actually um, eliminate false positives uh, in detecting men in the middle attacks just by adjusting the workflow following a user-centric design approach. We're also doing some meta research. Uh, for example, we are looking into the validity of um, using qualitative methods for security related problems. We look in risk modeling and we are using more and more methods from social sciences that are a little bit more exotic in our uh, security and privacy domain. So for example, autoethnography, um, yeah, it's surprising that we could actually publish a paper out of this because this is really a completely new method uh, in our field. So this is the overview of research topics and I'm really, really looking forward to having your questions and a very fruitful discussions about either the main topic of this talk or also any of these topics um, that I'm excited about and working on. Thank you so much. Thank you also to the online participants. Um, feel free to also ask questions in the chat. I'm trying to monitor it. Are there any questions? Which questions do you have for me? Can I ask a very quick question? Yes. 
let's say you want to do um, uploading of any of these studies, uh, and the person conducting the study is also the author of the paper. Yes. How do you deal with that tension and bias uh, within them? There was not really a tension when we did that um, because we were just fully transparent about this. And the good thing about autoethnography is, I mean, generally, I think the very great thing about qualitative methods is that you always get some results out of it, you know? Um, and in the case of autoethnography, this was the exact same thing. So we had a, um, a study on, so what we're working on a lot is about, um, public key authentication in mobile messaging, because it's a very well-defined security problem. Yeah, We really understand what the problem here is. So I think it's very suitable to conduct studies, um, user studies to also come up with design ideas and also with autoethnography. So one uh, of my PhD students just went with uh, his Signal app over like, I think two months or three months time and just reported how it was for him to perform uh, key authentication with his communication partners and what obstacles he came across. And although this is, of course, a very biased view because he's the researcher, but you clearly see like what the hurdles are. And I mean, if a security researcher has this problem, you know, how can, how can we accept, expect end users to deal with this in any way? Yeah, but I was also, to be honest, very surprised that we got this paper published at Kai <laughs> because we, did, I mean, I did not expect it because it's quite an exotic approach, I would say, but very powerful because before we do these costly and time consuming studies with users, it's good to know like what are the pain points that we see when we use these methods ourselves. Yes. Many, so <laughs> many thoughts at least. So uh, I think this is really the, the true beauty of interdisciplinary research, right? Because it uncovers exactly like where we need to modify and where we need to, you know, balance things carefully. <clears throat> so I think as a researcher, as a scientist, it's also my job to be an advocate for the problems and for the grand challenges that society faces in times of digitization, right? And I think, you know, just uncovering this um, will help us to also maybe inspire policymakers and politicians to make proper legislations for these things, because this is not something, in my opinion, a user should not be even asked to make this decision, because how can any user understand what all these ad trackers do and where their data goes and what the implications are? This is completely unrealistic because also, I mean, I mean, there's a paper that actually makes me quite sad, which was a study that actually asked users if they want targeted advertising. And people said yes, because they were always suggested products that they really like, you know, me with my privacy heart, of course, this is like, this can't be true, you know, I don't want to live in this world. <laughs> but, but the point is, what are the consequences for the users? I think for many users, there are also no direct consequences associated with this. But we don't know what the world looks in like 20, 30 years from now and what we can do with all this data. So 
none of these users can actually understand or judge this risk properly, and not even we as scientists can. I mean, we have a, also our own political agenda with this, right? So why are we even putting all this burden on users? Because then in the end we can say, yeah, but you consented. So this is completely wrong. And we should completely, it's not informed consent, yeah, right? Because people are not informed, even if we give them walls of text. So this should be removed completely, in my opinion. Many of these things need to be removed from humans, from end users in particular. What I always like to say, uh, we don't have chalks here, but um, in biology, for example, this, this concept of uh, umbrella, uh, umbrella conservation, that's the right word, yeah? So for example, the marine ecosystem, if you wanna protect the small planktons, you have to uh, protect the big predators. So the hammerhead sharks basically, yeah? And by doing that, you will protect all the other species that are below. In security, it's not that different, right? We need to actually start with the people who build the systems and the policy makers and not start with the end users. But if we can make sure that some vulnerabilities are not even part of the modern systems that people use or policies are made in a certain way that some of these problems cannot even occur we also protect the end users so the same paradigm applies actually in my opinion and i think that's a paradigm that we need to that we need to follow in security and privacy research much more they were effectively ready, but just nobody knew about this. Yes. And in a way, like, what's the legal action to that is to form them and to resolve it? Is not a better solution, but for them to make better than anything. I'm a big fan of that we finally have a GDPR. Yeah, I mean, I think especially now during COVID, people also started to appreciate that we have some legislative, but it's not a perfect legislative. It's a very good way forward. It's not perfect because, I mean, now we have maybe we can argue that we have transparency and that we inform users and that we give people a choice people cannot make this choice end users should not be the ones who are making these choices they don't understand it but it's going in the right direction yeah so, uh, if the uh, i guess uh, uh, legend that is how uh cookie form should look in any way like for example, could I say as a as a um, company say, well, you know, to the bank at least you have to solve the application or something inexplicable or their game or whatever. If we do that, there is some restrictions on that or not? Because like they kind of want like the only key that is the one from Google that you have to leave like, and everything works is a one key for you by example, which takes me may be daily from the public broadcasting of music as well. Uh, like you guys, you said, like I pay for it, right? Yeah. I pay you know, and you write the paper that you can buy your cookie for about six to eight. <laughs> but yeah, if you interested in some legislation on how to do it, I am really no legal expert. I think there is. Uh... I'm honest, I cannot tell to which extent this is, um, yeah. But in my in my opinion, I mean, cookie banners are are directly out of hell and we should get rid of them and, yeah. Question slash consideration. So we're going to write like the system design and the awareness of the policy and security. We want to expand them in a way to be usable, but can we also get it to be profitable for how much? I think so. I think so. Um, I agree that this is like kind of, especially when it comes to privacy. And again, you know, this cookies, uh, tracking, that is really a challenge, right? Because the business model, I mean, companies need to make money uh, and still uh, expose users. Um, I think there is a way out because also there, I mean, I think in, the pri in privacy, it's particularly tricky. Um, I think in other ways, it could be better solvable. Uh, but I think there needs to be some advocacy from, from legislators, actually. Because, for, for example, if we now take the um, smart speakers as an example, right? I mean, there's a business model behind it. It's a business model why it's designed in a certain way. Um, but I think the legislator could maybe more strictly enforce how this is communicated to the users and not in terms of a lengthy policy, but maybe even design guidelines for the systems. I don't know. You know, the point... It is. It is. 
Yes. Which is like, okay, you don't properly buy the And it's probably worse than what we there before. Yes. And this is only like to get rid of the So I think what we really need, I mean, what we have done now in the last 30 years in my field is uncovering these problems. I am a little bit fed up of doing all these user studies and uncovering more problems because what we see is that the same mistakes and problems are repeated over and over again. What I think is we need a radical paradigm shift towards design, aggregating knowledge from different sources, combining threat modeling, design, all of this in one pile and finding effective ways of using all this knowledge we have from these empirical studies into like better policies, better systems, better guidelines for implementation, education for developers, and so on and so forth. I am like really like waiting now for this step in our community to happen, because I think this is how we need to move forward. Because so far, we are really talking mostly about problems and not sufficiently about solutions. And as you see, I mean, I also don't have an answer for that, you know? I'm not sure about Exactly. I mean, this is because because this is a societal problem. Like, I mean, I think this is really one of the big grand challenges. I mean, we are like having nuclear power plants that are connected to the internet. Over exaggerating, yeah. But this is like this is the world we are, we are living in. We're trying to make everything digital. Everything. Um, we can talk about implants, implanted computers, everything. So we're really moving everything to the digital domain. This is a grand challenge. We need to find ways of solving it because for now we don't have any solutions for that. Yeah. Exciting times for researchers like us. Yes. I was asked this recently. So a success story that I always like to talk about because, because part, part of my research contributed to it was um, actually uh, we did user studies with uh, administrators to understand uh, usability problems that prevent them for uh, configuring HTTPS correctly. Because of all these studies and many more, not only ours, you know, Let's Encrypt, CertBot, all these tools were developed to automate the process and to take all this usability overhead out of the way of administrators and especially these complex security decisions. I think that's not a perfect solution because it's again, you know, an, an, an add-on, a usable add-on. But I think what was done right there was that knowledge that we have from all these studies was transferred into something meaningful. And it was actually quite effective and it's kind of a cheap solution, right? Because it's just automating all these tricky bits. Yeah, fine, it works. So I think that's that's actually a really good solution. Um, interestingly, like on the other hand, uh, on the other end, we see that usability is done right, for example, in recommender algorithms for uh, YouTube, how is it called? YouTube shorts, I think. Instagram reels, all these things, you know, highly addictive you know when people use these systems they they stay on these short videos for hours i think because they just maximized usability and user experience they turned it into a priority in security and privacy it never has been a priority and i think if we turn it into a priority i think we can maybe have similar advances maybe not as great because again it's a secondary interaction goal not a primary interaction goal but i think we just need to make it a priority I'm still trying to think of a better example. It's really, really, really different. Yeah, yeah. But I, I agree because I also like to talk about positive things. <laughs> so you're the moderator, so you are, uh, I don't know how much, I mean, I'm here all the time. So until dinner time. Yes. Have a good.